everyone, and welcome to our talk, uh, which is called Multi-Cloud Global Content Distribution at Cloud Native Speeds. Speeds, we promised a lot of buzzwords here, but I promise you won't uh, leave the talk disappointed. So, before we start, a couple of words about us. My name is Sirka Kremzer. I come from Brno, and currently, uh, besides being maintainer of KHB project, I also work for, for a startup called Kedify.io, where we try to productize Keda, which is an autoscaler for Kubernetes. Uh, by that, I'm passing my word to my colleague, Yuri. Hey, everybody. <clears throat> Thanks a lot for joining today in one of the last talks on this wonderful conference. So uh, we really appreciate it. Uh, so I'm Yuri. I work uh, at Dumbbound. Uh, so cross-plane is uh, my main game. Right, uh, but today we are going to uh, talk about different projects in the Kubernetes Global Balancer that I created a while ago, and here you joined me later on as a maintainer. So uh, let's kick it off. So basically, overall uh, topic of this uh, presentation is uh, global content distribution, but not just a content distribution, but in an open source way, right? So traditional GSOV, global server load balancing for uh, global traffic steering, is solved by uh, uh, vendors, proprietary vendors, usually uh, proprietary cloud providers like AWS, Azure GCP, and we basically want to change this picture, uh, sharing our project experience uh, and uh, that we built uh, across uh, these years. And basically the main uh, requirements for uh, our story is that the project and the solution should be open source, should be cloud native, uh, vendor neutral is very important, uh, ideally part of CNCF, right? And it should be as environment agnostic as possible, uh, multi-cloud, you should run it in a private cloud, any data centers, so we should have this freedom, no environment locking, and it should be API driven for a seamless integration with any kind of automation and should run on top of Kubernetes and integrate uh, with a Kubernetes ecosystem. So benefit from a rich ecosystem that we have uh, in a Kubernetes area. And uh, with that in mind, we would like to introduce uh, KGB, Kubernetes Global Balancer Project, uh, uh, that solves exactly this challenge of global traffic steering in an uh, open source and cloud native manner. So let's dive uh, into how it works. Maybe a quick show of hands, who heard about the project before, Kubernetes Global Balancer? Perfect. Yeah, perfect, uh, much more than I expected. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, so, uh, the project uh, itself, uh, it was originally designed to handle high-impact uh, regional failures and uh, uh, the core of the machinery is uh, DNS-driven, DNS-based. So, we are using a DNS as a battle-tested protocol uh, that is running the internet for, to actually uh, solve the global traffic steering and make these kind of decisions. All the complexity is hidden behind the simple customer source and customer resource definition, so everything is nicely abstracted. And uh, one of the important uh, uh, unique features of this project is that there is no managing cluster, so there is no like centralized uh, cluster where you you are doing this uh, uh, traffic uh, balancing decisions. Uh, we deploy KGB uh, controller next to the workloads, right? And inherently, there is no single point of failure. If one cluster uh, from the fleet is going down, uh, or application is going down there, uh, the whole thing survives. And we are supporting multiple global load balancing strategies to make it as flexible as possible. A little bit of history. So it originated in, in APSA, and APSA is South African uh, bank, financial organization that uh, uh, I had an honor to work uh, with, and uh, later on, Yuri joined as well. So basically, how it started, uh, instead of, I joined TAPSA like five, four or five years ago, roughly, and instead of uh, boring uh, bank kind of onboarding, they asked me to build a GSLB solution that is Kubernetes native. So that was a nice challenge, and it kind of picked up, and uh, we are, talking here, so the project was created. And so the main goal was to steer the uh, traffic between geographically dispersed clusters. APSA had a on-prem presence in a couple of data center and also moving uh, gradually to cloud, so all this traffic management was super important. 
Another unique uh, feature of uh, project is that uh, compared to the standard uh, global load balancing solution and even just uh, load balancing solutions, we are not relying on a standard end-to-end -end HTTP and checks. We uh, know the internal state of the application from the pod health level. So standard uh, health check and points work and uh, KGB is a global balancer is aware of uh, uh, in, in cluster state of, of the application, so e developers can basically create these health checks and uh, you, you have a flexibility and control over your application that is backed up by KGB for uh, global balancing. Uh, it was, uh, the main goal was to replace a proprietary vendor solution and we basically very succeeded in this goal. KGB is currently in production for many years in APSA. Uh, and the project was started in the end of uh, 2019, and uh, it is also OSS project from day zero, so it was pretty nice uh, move from the bank to support uh, uh, creation of uh, open source first, so instead of like baking it internally, you know, this is the classic story where when the project is internal, and then it's a painful open source process, we build it in open from day zero, and it enabled a very nice velocity. So, uh, Let's go to a couple of high-level use cases, how you can use KGB and how, and how it can help with the global resilience of the applications uh, that are running on top of your Kubernetes clusters. So first uh, use case is handling regional failure. So assuming uh, we have uh, three clusters, it's just an example, right? You can have two, you can have more than three. So we will stick with an example of uh, uh, Kubernetes cluster deployment in the United States region, in Europe, and in China. And in this uh, scenario, uh, we have a primary cluster uh, pinned in the United States, and when everything is healthy, by default, uh, customers, the clients of your application, they're going to be steered to the healthy primary United States cluster. What happens uh, if a cluster fails or application fails on top of this cluster? Uh, so maybe is, is there is some misconfiguration of the application, maybe cluster goes down, maybe there is some natural disaster like floods. Uh, so uh, KGB will take care of the traffic steering uh, based on DNS and it will uh, uh, relay uh, and redirect uh, uh, the sessions, uh, the request to uh, secondary clusters, in this case it's in Europe and China. Uh, eventually the primary cluster got healthy and uh, the traffic steered back. So everything nice and predict predictable on a global level. So you ca that's how you can handle uh, these uh, geographical regional size failures in a nice cloud native manner. Second use case is a spread it, uh, to spread the load over the ge geographical multiple uh, geo regions, right? So here we have the same uh, United States, EU, China, and the uh, KGB can just here in a roughly like a round ro ra random round robin manner, but roughly equally across uh, uh, those three locations, and we also have a weighted, uh, uh, weighted version of it where you can uh, uh, assign percentages. Uh, and main use case number three is a multi-region content distribution. So basically the main uh, focus of this talk, right? It's uh, three locations and this is example and uh, clients and the customers of the applications, they are steered to the closest one. So United States users are going to be uh, redirected to the US clusters, European to Europe and Chinese to China, pretty straightforward, right? So when we have a, a matching uh, geographical database queries, it's going to be uh, as effective from a, a routing standpoint as possible by geolocation. So uh, how all this magic works? Uh, uh, we have uh, three main components in the project. So one is uh, embedded core DNS. So it's uh, like an integral part of the project. It's not in cluster core DNS. It's a separate deployment that is dedicated to serve DNS requests and provide a dynamically crafted uh, DNS responses according to GSLB strategy. Another important component is external DNS. It's also uh, part of the KGB deployment and it is used to automatically configure the zone delegation. So if you know how zone delegation in DNS works, we need to create uh, an S record type a DNS record type and a glue a records to point to our clusters to make them authoritative uh, for a specific zone uh, request. And so that's how we integrate in a, wide, a wider DNS environment like Route 53 or Azure. And basically we are making our core DNSs uh, responsible for the main DNS uh, request flow. 
And a KGB controller is an operator, right, that coordinates all the logic and uh, glues all the pieces together and uh, creates all the uh, environment in an automated way to act according to global server load balancing strategy. A little bit more uh, uh, zoom out like a, uh, and diagram how it works when it's interconnected, right? So we can see uh, that uh, uh, our clients request to uh, FQDN like application example.com, assuming we configure the KGB to serve that zone. Uh, first thing first, the external DNS is going to configure automatically the zone delegation in one of the environmental DNS. We call it the edge DNS, so it can be your cloud DNS provider, your internal, like Infobox driven or any kind of DNS that is uh, uh, important uh, wide for, for your environment. And uh, after the zone delegation is out con uh, configured, then the clients are going to be automatically uh, uh, pointed to the core DNS instances that are part of the KGB uh, deployment and uh, in coordination uh, with the uh, application health status, uh, the KGB controller is going to populate associated DNS endpoint CRs that are internal, uh, used for internal communication and eventually core DNS will respond with a set of IP addresses that are uh, for, uh, created and, and uh, formed according to the GSLB star strategy and eventually at the last uh, stage uh, clients will be contacting the standard ingress controller in a Kubernetes, right? So we are building up uh, on the top of standard Kubernetes machinery so everything is uh, integrated and reliable. So it works uh, in a, uh, it's pretty simple. Uh, at the same time, it requires quite amount of coordination and complexity from operation standpoint. So, uh, good news that everything is automated and the all complexity is actually hidden behind the single uh, JSLB uh, customer source. So that is uh, customer source kind JSLB with this uh, our API group version, and uh, that's exactly the resource that is getting reconciled by a KGB controller. And here we just uh, pointing to some specific uh, network resource in a, a classic scenario, it's ingress. So we are referencing it by API version kind and match label. Uh, we are picking up the data from uh, existing ingress uh, that uh, FQDN uh, and uh, cost name and transitively we figuring out the uh, uh, healthiness of the applications from a service endpoint array. And uh, next to it, uh, we just declaring the GSLB uh, global lo load balancing strategy. Like in this example, we are declaring failover and a primary geotech for the cluster. We say in it like it will be this uh, e the U West one. And uh, geotechs are very flexible. You can assign a a any kind of text uh, to your clusters. Historically, we were embedding ingress into the spec, but now recently with the recent releases, we now can uh, reference existing ingresses and also adding support for a new net networking, uh, networking resources like uh, we just released uh, virtual services for Istio yeah, support. So uh, it's a nice point to speak about uh, multiple integrations, right? So. KGB uh, is architected to, uh, to be run on top of any sensei of conformed Kubernetes clusters. That means that you can run it anywhere in cloud, public cloud, private cloud, uh, uh, any data center hybrid scenario, so uh, full flexibility. Uh, historically, we are using uh, like a standard ingress controller or like with standard ingress with a set of ingress controllers. So again, via environment agnostic as possible, any kind of ingress controller uh, should work. We tested Nginx and traffic in uh, most of our deployments that we know. And uh, as I mentioned, we are extending the integration scope and uh, recently released uh, Istio virtual service support and a gateway API is on the roadmap. From a zone delegation uh, standpoint, so uh, as I mentioned, you need a zone delegation for a full automation. Theoretically, you can basically hook in KGB into any uh, DNS environment by creating this NS and A records, but this uh, full delegation support uh, uh, provides a full automation for you, right? So we tested in AWS Route 3 Azure Public DNS, NS1, Infoblox on-prem, where it was actually originated in NAPSA, uh, recent addition of Cloudflare, and RFC 2136, uh, so you can uh, hook in open source bind or Windows DNS, so pretty, pretty good coverage here. 
Uh, yeah, and global load balancing strategies. Finally, like mapping it back to the original use cases, we have this round robin for uh, uh, spreading over uh, the multiple clusters, right, in a random manner, roughly equal, but roughly. It, to support more, more powerful version of it is a weighted round robin where we can actually assign percentages of its traffic uh, steering to the specific uh, geographical location. A failover, uh, probably most popular uh, strategy um, for a uh, uh, straightforward uh, failover between the uh, uh, primary and secondary cluster. So uh, people like it for like it's predictable, right? Easy, easy to test uh, the disaster recovery and disaster scenario. So we can, uh, it's one of the most used strategy for, for us. And a GOP is probably most advanced where we need to actually decide dynamically the closest location out of geographical database. And uh, that's a most related strategy for, to the main uh, uh, main title of this talk today. So let's uh, dive in into GOP and ERG Predicts take over. Thanks. So a little bit of details about the GOIP because this one is probably the most uh, sophisticated one. It requires a little bit of setup before, before it starts working. It doesn't work out of the box. You need a special database for that. It's a binary format from MaxMind. You can download a pre prepared database with these uh, metadata about, about IP addresses called GeoLite 2, or you can craft yourself, your, uh, your own. We have an example on our GitHub uh, how to do that. So for instance, if you have on-prem data centers, you can craft your own uh, data centers and put some IP ranges there. And how it works, it uses a feature of DNS called eDNS client subnet option. So basically when doing the uh, DNS request, it, asks, it, it adds some metadata about the client itself, namely the IP address. And then we try to fetch the IP from the database. And based on some metadata from, from these records, we answer or we, the core DNS, which is part of the KGB installation, answers with the correct IP with the same, 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 same tag. So it can be partitioned based on country ISO code. So for instance, is if you ask from Austria, you will get IP from Austria, but you can also partition all the IPs based on the continent code, and that's what we are gonna do in our demo. It doesn't work with all DNS DNSs out there, for instance, as a resolver. So for instance, if you use Cloudflare, this famous 111 uh, DNS resolver, it doesn't, doesn't work because it drops the eDNS payload. But if you use, for instance, Google One, it will just work. Right, so, Let's check our demo. We have a multi-cluster setup. That's what we promised at the beginning. We actually have a different cloud providers there. So in America, we have GK, GKE cluster and the IP is starting with 34. And in Europe, we have AWS cluster and the IP starts with 18. Right, so I've prepared, prepared a demo, so let's inspect what, what's there. So as I said, we have two Kubernetes contexts. One is the EU, EU cluster and one is the US cluster. Let's inspect the, the AWS cluster. I'm quickly typing. <laughs> so there are two nodes. And they should be running some, some version of Ubuntu. Yeah, you can see that this AWS as a suffix. Now, if I do the same for, for the, the other cluster, the GCP one. All right, and there is also a Nginx, Nginx controller de, uh, deployed. So if I, it's also exposed as, a, as, as this host name. And if I dig it, basically resolve the host name to an IP address, I'm getting this 18. Remember, this is the European one. And I'm calling this uh, service, which is handy. It's resolving some metadata about the IP. It's similar to this MaxMind database, but it's a REST, REST endpoint, just for demo purposes. As you, as you can see, it's, it's based in London, just to prove it's, it's a geographically dispersed. Now, if we do similar stuff for the GCP cluster, should be running just one node. But so, you know, we allow some heterogeneity. We have different cloud providers, different number of nodes, but there has to be some similar configuration on both of the clusters. So yeah, it is GKE, right? This is the external IP of the ingress controller. 
if I call the similar REST endpoint for this IP, I can see that this is IP from, from United States. So that's our setup. We can also deploy, we also deployed a sample application in both clusters called PodInfo. So this, there is a simple deployment. It's an application made by Stefan Perban, who is the creator of Flux, by the way. But it can be any workload. We are just demonstrating uh, HTTP requests. And we have two uh, global uh, st strategies of how to load balance the traffic. One was failover, and one is GIP. We are not demonstrating the round robin because it's a very simple one. The sim same stuff is present or, oh, and it created ingress for us. So this is basically the entry point to the application, right? Same demo app is deployed on a, on a GCP cluster. And so this is in a way, we assume some kind of homogeneity about, about those two clusters. It needs to have same application, right? But at the same time, we allow for variability in terms of ops, right? Operations, you can use any hardware, any distribution. Right, so this is the exploration what we have. Now the first uh, use case will be failover. So we have, a, we have those two clusters, right? One of them was set as a primary one. So that means we are basically grabbing the primary from this GSLB CR, which was actually also displayed on the, on, the, on the slides before. And we can see that EKS, EU, is the primary one. That means that if we basically call this endpoint, only the EU cluster will, 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 will respond. We can resolve the IP, and we can see it was the European IP. EU. We can simulate the, fa the failure on that cluster just to demonstrate that, that it works, right? So we can either scale the deployment to zero or if the application is crash, crash looping, but in this case, we'll, we'll change the container image to some put typo so it wouldn't be able to run. And in this case, uh, KGB just kicked in and trying to, just trying to solve the situation. Uh, we resolved this uh, host name, and we can see we got an IP from America right away. We were lucky because TTL was 60 seconds and it was pretty fast. But in the worst case, we would have 60 seconds based on your TTL settings on the DNS. And if I call it again, it's, it's uh, responding with US East before it was, it was uh, EU cluster. So, if we change it back, uh, the GSLB still uh, knows or is, is configured that EU cluster should be the primary one. But if we heal it, uh, we can see that it's, it's still in bad shape because it's not able to pull the image because we introduced a typo there. If we, if we fix it, uh, the health check on that application will eventually pass. So basically, the Kubernetes probes uh, will pass. Endpoint will be created for this, uh, for this application and it will be recovered. So let's check that. We have fixed it here and we are asking, we are trying to resolve the, the host name again and waiting for the 18 to appear here because 18 is the Europe. And we can see that TTL is slowly ticking, right? It's 22.9. Uh, it's, it's weird because now it's, it, was, it responded nine in here and 10 in here. It's because we have actually have two DNS servers and they are same likely to respond, right? Because we have two clusters and using the zone delegation at this very last step, there are two DNS, DNS uh, endpoints that are same, same, to, same, same likely to respond. Once the DTL, yeah, now it's expired, DTL 60 again, and responded with IP from, from Europe. If I call the girl again, it didn't work <laughs> because there are caches involved everywhere at DNS. It may some, take some time, but eventually, eventually it will just work. Yeah, right now it, it's, it says EU. So that, that's basically the failover demo. It's once the primary cluster is down, the other one will took it over, and once it's, it's up again, it will just switch back to the primary one, as shown in the, in the, in the slides. Now let's check the GeoIP cluster, GeoIP use case, which is kind of more complex. There's the 
using the MM, MMDB for, for partitioning the traffic based on the IP. So here I'm calling if config me, which is like, what's my IP address, right? So it's this one. And I'm plugging it into the same REST endpoint as before, just to check that, all right, looks like it's correct, it's Austria. And now if I plug this IP address to a, okay, first let's check that Cloudflare doesn't really support it, right, because I mentioned it in the slides, but let's check it. In Dig, you can, you can plug a explicit name server you want to use, so I'm plugging Cloudflare in here and resolving it. And as you can see, it responded with both IPs, America and EU. That's what it does when it doesn't know. Like it, it wasn't able to extract the, uh, this metadata from the client subnet, so it doesn't know and it responded with all. If I use the 888 from Google, which I know that passes the client subnet uh, metadata, it should just work. Let's try that. And it worked because I'm from Austria it extracted the country code, oh, sorry, the continent code, and this IP, which is one of the available responses, has the same continent code, so yeah, it, it worked. But I didn't put the, uh, uh, Google's name server here, it's because it's implicitly configured in my ads resolve, resolve conf. If I contact the application not on the dig level but on the like, HTTP level using curl, I can see that from my IP is returning the EU response. Oh, and this is, this is a different different endpoint. Right? Before it was failover, geo IP, and now it's geo, sorry, failover, dot demo, dot blah, 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 and now it's geo IP, dot blah, 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 blah. Now, we can simulate the request from different continent by plugging in some American IP to either dig, or later on we can see that we can spawn a pod there. So here I'm doing that. Oh, I'm actually I'm asking specif specifically our one of our uh, name servers for the IP, so we, ca we can see that it's an European one, and we can plug in also the America IP. I have one, so let's try that, just to prove that it's an uh, American IP, I'm also again calling the, the curl. And here I'm plugging like, dig has also a sub command called, or argument called subnet, when you can plug in like this. And we can see it responded with the American IP. Dig is a pretty powerful tool, by the way. So we have, it, 888 was explicit, implicitly used because it was my default resolver, right? Now I'm starting a pod in our US cluster to show you that we can contact the application and we don't have to put the IP explicitly to this client subnet because it's actually its own IP address, right? If, if you spawn a pod in America, it will have an American IP address. So I'm curling the geo IP again and I'm going, I'm, I having, I'm getting the response from the, the cluster in US. Yeah, so let's also check the logs that our core internal core DNS server was actually called. We can do that by uh, asking our, one of our core DNS uh, server explicitly by specifying it here, because I want to be sure it was the correct one, because otherwise it would be same likely to get the response from one of those. And I'm looking the, at the logs, and as we can see, uh, extracting some geodata from the request. They extracted the EU. There are two IPs that were uh, candidate for a response, but only one was, was returned. Yeah, that pretty much concludes the demo. I think we are good with time, so I can show you also a CLI tool where you can ins inspect those databases, especially crafted for this use case. It's called MMDB Inspect. And this is the database file that needs to be plugged into this CoreDNS core plugin. So what I did here is I'm asking what's my IP and I'm asking, hey, resolve it for me with using this, this tool, then like jQuerying it and displaying it. 
And it, as we can see, if I plug in my own I, current IP address, this is what I'm getting here. And as we can see, there is continent code EU. And if I show you the configuration of, of the internal core DNS I'm currently using, as you can see, this continent.code. So this is the same path, like JSON path in quotes. So that metadata field that needs to be the same in order to get the same response. And this is the path to this, to this database. All right, so that pretty much concludes the demo. And it's also available on this, on this link, so you can look it up later. Do you want to close the, close the presentation? Thanks a lot for the great demo, Ergy. So, just to conclude with the current project status. So, we are part of CNCF Sandbox. An incubating proposal is planned. I'm still procrastinating the paperwork, but I think we will do it. Uh, we have uh, three public adopters, so you know, like if you are managing a CNCF project, you have an adopter SMD. So we have uh, three companies who, who publicly claim that they're using KGB in production, so it's pretty cool. It's actually originally APSA, right, so where it's already deployed, and we have also Millennium BCP, largest uh, Portuguese private bank, uh, who are actively using it, also in prod, so they're pretty cool guys. Uh, we are also two times finalists uh, of a nice event called CNCF Security Slam, where we created all the crazy uh, salsa cosine things. So actually, Yurji uh, did uh, most of the heavy lifting there. So we have a very cool supply and chain processes during the release. Uh, additional artifact after the, out of this experience is a best score and CLO monitor. If you know, like it's a kind of healthiness of open source project in CNCF. So we are apparently very healthy. And uh, uh, we have a pretty uh, good community of maintainers, so from multiple companies, APSA, Abound, myself, KD5, ERG, and uh, recently Andre from Open Systems joined, and he made incredible contributions for a uh, new set of functionality in the projects. And uh, we also have a, a community of contributors, so Millennium BCP, these Portuguese folks are, who are running it in production, they also, they can actually contributed to Azure DNS support, it was uh, very good. Uh, Tetrate folks were active in discussion for quite a while. And D2IQ, Jimmy uh, actually created a nice GOP extension that enabled us uh, to create the demo today. So yeah, thank you so much for all the contributors. And the closest roadmap, if we shorten it and simplify, so Gateway API support is definitely on the roadmap. You would like to integrate with as much uh, project of, uh, in Kubernetes ecosystem as possible. Gateway API support will enable us to do so. And uh, this one is uh, Google Cloud DNS support. It's for automated zone delegation. It's, uh, it will enable us to declare like that we support three major hyperscalers fully, right? So currently, as you uh, seen in the demo, you can run KGB on top of uh, GC but there is no uh, zone delegation automation. So we use the route 53 for, um, uh, for the management. Yeah, uh, yeah and uh, we stabilizing the core API and the <coughs> overall uh, project is getting mature. So we are about to release KGB 1.0 pretty soon because now as we excluded the embedded ingress from the mandatory part of the spec, now it's optional so we can use this resource references in a very flexible manner, the core API will be very stable so we can declare we won pretty soon. So thank you so much for joining. Please visit the official website, kgb.io. Please star us on GitHub, we really like stars. And if you uh, adopt the project, please uh, send the pull request for adopters and uh, MD. It will really help us with the CNCF maturity processes so, like, uh, uh, so we can uh, declare this uh, support and adoption of the project. And last but not least, please join us in Salt Lake City if you are around. Uh, we will run a second ever KGB country fest there where we focus on an actual like, ex extension and adding a new resource support uh, uh, be benefiting from our latest functionality on uh, resource references. So that's it. Thank you so much and we appreciate your time. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, so we have uh, five minutes for questions, and we have stickers for anybody who asks, so uh, please shoot. Yeah, please, can we get a mic or? Yeah. 
Uh, yeah, any uh, conformant C uh, Kubernetes cluster will work totally. Uh, you Here. mentioned cube edge. You mentioned cube edge. Uh, well, mm. cube edge is a little bit more difficult because it has some constraints when it comes to networking. Mm -hmm. So, to be honest, we haven't <laughs> tried, but it could work. <laughs> like. Let's try to integrate. Great question. Thank you. Anybody else? Please. Uh, Yeah, honestly, I was just very lucky. We had a leadership that is very open source focused, right? So we had a, all like, you know, vertical support from a, a CTO of the bank and uh, all the team, like, you know, so it was very advantageous situations that I, uh, like as a main developer and architect of the uh, project, I was able to test it like on you know, a second week and get the feedback and that's what enabled Velocity. Any other questions? Please. So external DNS, so it's a uh, project that um, has a, like a wide support of a d different DNS providers, right? Uh, our main challenge was probably adding NS record support across the provider set. So for some reason, it was always lacking behind, and that's one of the reasons that we, we still maintaining external DNS fork in our organization uh, to support the Azure NS record, right? That is crucial for zone delegation configuration. That's true. Yeah, please. If I may add to it. Uh, mm -hmm. It's because the external DNS actually doesn't support uh, CRDs, so, but we actually, or our colleague changed that, so we have a, a CRD called DNS endpoint. DNS endpoints, and this is not part of the external DNS uh, uh, upstream. Well, actually, DNS endpoint is part of external oh, DNS, it's okay. <laughs> but it's not <laughs> part of core DNS, so like we have a, yeah. Oh, question, yeah. Wasn't yeah. A, was it a question about external DNS or core DNS? So yeah, this is the correct correct thing. It's, it's a it's a it's a project, right? And it it's a it works on based on annotations where you annotate an ingress, and then it for you creates a DNS records. But this is the change our colleague done. So we, it's also support CRDs. So we we are creating custom resources, and external DNS takes this uh, CR and creates a, a record for zone, dele zone delegation only. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is blue box on this uh, diagram, right? So we have this DNS endpoint CR custom resource and the external DNS is, re is reading from it and then eventually makes this external API key to create an S and glue air records. And the same DNS uh, endpoint type used for core DNS backend, right? So it can read this dynamically crafted D DNS responses. Great question. I think we are al almost the last one, so I think we have still time to, I can show you this, 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 this one in like detail. So we have three, three records here. And this one is for zone delegation. So if I show it to you, and it's readable enough, with namespace KGB. Oh, sorry, on YAML. You can see there is a there are two two targets and one IP for it because it's like. The, the cluster is managing only its, its own IP, and the other one is managing its, its the, the other IP, right, so. Uh, but it's very important that the, both of the KGB enabled clusters, they are always returning consistent response, no matter where the client landed, right? So they are uh, coordinating its uh, status, like in a horizontal manner between the clusters also based on the, the special DNS, FQDNS local target, internal one, yeah. Any other questions? So I think we can, oh, last one, please. Yeah? Name. <laughs> 
No, we, we actually have a public. We, we have a public GitHub issue around it, so it was a community decision. It was like, you know, kind of, it was a joke that, yeah, end up as a project name, so. <laughs> Thank you. Very relevant question. Thank you. So, looks like that's it. So, thank you so much.